Hello everyone, welcome to the Hormone Helper Podcast. I'm Coach Andrew, your Hormone Helper from Fit For All Fitness. I personally coach over 1,600 men and women to help better understand their hormones so they can lose weight and get their metabolism back on track. With this podcast, you're going to hear from me and my special guests about everything from metabolism to thyroid to weight loss, and we even talk a little bit of sexy time as we chat to spread more knowledge thick like butter on your hormones. If you're ready to learn, I'm ready to share, so let's do this. Hello everyone, welcome back to The Hormone Helper, and today we're going to chat about women's health and put together a little guide of specific things that normally go wrong with women's hormones. So that way, you know what to look for if you're a lady. Now, for the guys listening, don't tune out because maybe the missus, a friend, your mom or sister, they might be struggling too, and it's good to kind of know what's going on so then maybe you can help point them in the right direction in case they are experiencing certain symptoms too. So for this podcast, I'm not going to talk about all the symptoms because there are a ton and I'll do a separate video on symptoms themselves. Instead, we're going to chat about the three main hormones that shift off in a woman's hormone panel. So three hormones that woman needs to pay attention to, and they are as follows, estrogen, cortisol, and your thyroid hormone. So estrogen, cortisol, and thyroid, why are those a big deal from a woman's perspective and what is it that they have to look for? Well... Women's hormones and men's hormones are completely different, and that's because female hormones cycle. They cycle every 28 to 31 days, as well as females go through premenopause, they go through menopause state, and then they go through postmenopause. So during each area, or I should say each time in their life, hormones change for a specific reason, as well as the fact that they're shifting every 28 to 31, 32-ish days for their fertility cycle, there's a lot of change that happens in the female hormone panel. So all of the hormones are made in the identical fashion as they would for a male, but females require a certain amount, of course, because fertility, if you need to carry a baby, the body always has to prep and prepare for that as well too, as the body needs to anticipate having a higher amount of estrogen because females are estrogen dominant, unlike men who are testosterone dominant. So let's go through these three individual areas and then I'm going to explain why these areas are things that you have to take a look at. So number one, let's take a look at the role of estrogen. So estrogen effects, this is really for your period and your cycle control. And this is also for your libido and your ability to, of course, get pregnant and have children. So a couple estrogen effects. One, builds up the uterine lining. It increases body fat, and that's supposed to be storage for you to have children. Uh, it helps reduce depression and helps with headaches and migraines. Uh, it helps mitigate and manage your thyroid hormone because your fat storage hormone is your energy hormone. Uh, it helps decrease blood clotting. Uh, it helps increase libido. It helps with your blood sugar control, and it helps reduce the risk of any of your endometrial cancers or your breast cancer. So essentially, what estrogen is responsible for is the fat storage and the energy maintenance within the body. Now, for cortisol, cortisol acts as everyone's stress hormone. But for women especially, it's all about making sure that they have energy management for the purposes of fertility. So it's about being able to create a child, have the hormones for two, and then after that child leaves, you're supposed to have hormones for one again. Ideally, that's the whole purpose of why females are estrogen dominant and why cortisol tends to take a back seat. For men, it's actually the opposite case. Essentially, cortisol is higher and estrogen takes a back seat. So estrogen and cortisol tend to talk to each other. One of them is the energy usage and the other one is the energy storage hormone. So with both of them together, the idea is, is they are keeping the female body in a peak or optimal range to actually allow them to have kids. Ideally, if your estrogen level is stable and your cortisol level is stable, having children is no issue, your body fat is under control, you're able to gain the weight needed to support a second human being inside you, and then that human being gets to leave and then the weight comes off. So those are the two main hormones that a female is always looking through all the time. 
Now your estrogen essentially cycles through the every 28 to 32 days. So as your ovulation starts, your estrogen is going to start to increase. It's going to start to increase in a spike. It's preparing for when that egg is released, when that fertility or that uterine part is, is ready to, to go. So during that peak period of the month, you're going to have that kind of couple of days where estrogen is really high. And then of course your body gets rid of the uterine lining. And then that's where females have their period. So you start your bleeding process. So through this process, the body bleeds. And at this point, the estrogen is going to be kind of at its highest. And that estrogen actually gets lost through the period process or is supposed to normalize through the period process, in which case it goes down and it starts the entire process again. So that is happening every 28 to 32 days. Body builds up for fertility. If you get pregnant, great, then it's fine. Then something different happens. But if you don't get pregnant, then essentially the body gets rid of that uterine lining to do the same thing again next month. So once you come of age, essentially, this is what happens. So that means that a female's estrogen is going to cycle and it's going to basically act as like a huge tidal wave where it surges up into the point of when you have your period. And then once you have your period, estrogen drops a little bit and then it starts to normalize. Where we start to get effects of estrogen or where women have to start managing their estrogen level is if the estrogen gets to a point where they have an incredibly high spike followed by an incredibly low dip. Normally, if we have high estrogen, that is signaling the body to store higher amounts of weight. And normally when we have low estrogen, that's telling the body that I don't need to store weight anymore. What we want to do from a hormonal perspective is to keep as even or as stable a hormone level as possible. We don't want these high peaks and valleys within hormones. So ideally, even if someone is going through their period cycle, we don't want giant spikes because the higher the spike, the lower the crash and the distance between that spike and that crash, that's what you're going to feel. You're going to feel in terms of the increase in your weight, which is going to be body fat. You're going to feel it in your libido, and you're also going to feel it from an emotional standpoint too. Because estrogen is directly responsible for your de for depression, for levels of anxiety, for kind of your emotional management, this is why when someone or a female tends to go through their period, they tend to have different emotional changes. This is due to your hormones. So the more stable that peak, the more stable your energy level and your emotional level is. And that is a good thing. That's what you want. Stability every 28 to 32 days, because then your cortisol doesn't have to do work. Now, let's say you're having these really high peaks each and every month. Well, the higher the peak, the lower the crash. And if your estrogen crashes, it sends a signal to your cortisol, which is the energy usage hormone. You've got to kick in an overdrive. Now, from a cortisol perspective, cortisol being energy usage and energy management, if we crash, the body has to slow down the metabolism. So what are you going to get from a cortisol perspective? You're going to get things like low energy, low libido, chronic fatigue. You might feel muscle weakness or you're not strong or active or you're not really feeling like doing anything or feeling lethargic. Those are the types of things that you can experience with cortisol. It is reactive or reacting, I should say, to your estrogen and the level of estrogen. So when females come to me and my team through a vantage process and they're like, Andrew, I don't get it. Like I'm eating super healthy. I'm, I'm, I'm exercising, you know, two to three times a week. And for some reason, like my periods are a mess. My weight is all over the place. And I'm like, well, what do you mean your periods are a mess? And they're like, well, I get really heavy bleeding. It's spotting. It's inconsistent. Sometimes it starts up again. And I go, well, wait a second. That's an indicator that something is seriously wrong with your estrogen level. If those things aren't checked, estrogen is the main issue that females tend to deal with every single day.
And the reason why is alongside the fact that your estrogen changes every 28 to 32 days, you also have to look at external estrogen too. A lot of the foods that we cook and we eat with, they have estrogen preservatives, in which case we're eating food that causes our estrogen level to rise. Plastics also has estrogen in it as well. So drinking out of plastic water bottles. There's a reason why people say, hey, don't do that. Chemically, you are ingesting those chemicals and it is affecting your hormone panel. Not immediately, but over time. Three to six months of a plastic water bottle use can cause a 2 to 3% spike in a hormone change for estrogen. All because that is seeping. It's actually called estrogen seepage. It's seeping into your diet and routine to the point where you're like, holy crap, I'm actually starting to see a physical change. So estrogen is the main issue, and that's because it cycles to every 28 to 32 days. We have the internal that we have to monitor, and then we have external, which is going to come from food and from plastics that we store our stuff in. Those are huge. Secondary is then followed up by cortisol, and it's normally reacting. It's reacting to estrogen or it's reacting to stress. So because females are a little bit lower in testosterone, they do not have as much ability. And by not as much, I'm not talking about 60 or 40% reduced. I'm talking about 8 to 6% less. It's harder for females to recover from things because of the reduced amount of testosterone. So cortisol or your stress hormone has to pick up more of the weight for that recovery. Doing it every once in a while is fine. Cortisol can compensate for that. But if you continuously are chronically overstressed or overtaxing the system, well, that's where cortisol is going to start to be an issue and it's going to start to have a problem. Now, that third hormone, the one that I'll touch on last, is going to be your thyroid hormone. Your thyroid is reactive. It is the thermostat to your body's metabolism. So we cannot have a fast metabolism if cortisol is saying your energy usage is too much and estrogen is saying that you don't have enough energy to use. Your thyroid is reactive as to how the other two operate. So what happens typically for females is if they're struggling with stress issues or with estrogen issues, what ends up happening is, is the thyroid as a reaction says, I'm going to slow down this thermostat. I'm going to run slow. I'm going to run cold. So that way, maybe my cortisol and my estrogen can relax a little bit and, and they can start picking up some of the slack. So what are some of the things that females will feel from a thyroid perspective? Well, besides the fact that you're actually going to feel a tenderness in your thyroid, muscle soreness is huge, cold hands and cold feet, the inability to burn calories, lack of hunger, thinning of hair and brittle nails, because those are all external things that the body thinks of after the metabolism. So those are the role and the functions of those main three and the main three that females have to go through. Now, let's talk about the factors that actually affect women's hormones. So there's the stress. So chronic stress over time, there's a lot of things that stress can do. It can cause menstrual cycle irregularities. It depletes estrogen because you're overusing your fat storage hormone. And it can actually make PMS 10 times worse. Because if estrogen is kind of your emotional management state and you're always in a high stress period experiencing these high peaks of hormones, then of course stress is going to be the thing like the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's going to be too much for you. And then you're going to experience these high levels of symptoms and you're going to be really, really frustrated with that. Another thing to take a look at is your gut. Gut health is huge. An impaired gut health function, or holy cow, impaired gut function can actually lead to excess estrogen levels because your stomach is what digests and what gets rid of estrogen through the system. So if we have too much estrogen buildup, those estrogen hormones, they seep in and they sit in the stomach lining 
and they prevent you from digesting your food. So chronic bloating, IBS issues, stomach cramps, heavier spotted periods, undigested stool, heavy levels of constipation, passing stool like one time a day. All of those things are a result due to impaired gut function and it's caused by these hormones being out of whack. So it's not the stuff that you're eating. The, the worst thing, this is the totally off topic, but kind of on topic. The worst thing that you can do is get a food, a food insensitivity test or sense, no food sensitivity test. That's what it is. The problem with a food sensitivity test is it's making the assumption that your stomach is a hundred percent fine. So then it puts certain enzymes into your stomach. And when it doesn't digest it, it says, hey, you should not eat this food. If someone has a compromised gut, and most females do, and someone has a gut that's high in estrogen, in which case all food cannot be digested, that sensitivity test is going to say that a million and one foods are off. I know this personally. After going through my treatment when my estrogen was skyrocket high, three times the normal levels, there was nothing I could eat that did not trigger excessive levels of bloating to the point where my stomach literally distended to three times its size. I would eat an apple three times the size. I'd eat broccoli three times the size. I'd eat salmon with no salt three times the size. And I'm like, I don't get it. This is all healthy foods. And when I did my insensitivity test, I did four separate sensitivity tests and each time a completely different food was off the chart for insensitivity now when i address the estrogen issue and like for most of our clients when we work on our hormone reboot protocol to bring that estrogen down they're like oh my god the stuff that was bothering me with my food andrew it doesn't bother me anymore right because there's no estrogen in your stomach and if there's no estrogen in your stomach attacking the food, it actually allows you to digest it. So gut health is huge for women's hormones health. And if you're struggling with gut issues, then you need to start getting that address and the hormone reboot program might be a good fit for you. Third thing is toxins. So toxins and chemicals that we put on our body, they mimic hormones. I talked a little bit about it with the plastic and with the foods, but for females, deodorant and makeup. This is huge. There's a reason why you need to buy things that are natural or made from natural ingredients. There are a lot of chemicals out there that the body, it tricks the body into thinking, I think that's a hormone that's on my face. So what happens is is the body digests it and then it throws off your hormone system. So big example, lip balm. Lip balm is huge for this, excessively high in estrogen. Don't put things on your lips because your lips is right in line with your saliva gland and your saliva is how you digest and absorb stuff. So if you're putting stuff on your lips and it's not natural, you're ingesting it. And if you're ingesting it, it's going directly into your hormone system. These are the three main factors that affect women and their hormones and the toxins That is something that a lot of women don't take into account. If you think about it, if your deodorant has a chemical, you put it on twice a day or someone like me three times a day because you're paranoid of smelling. Or for example, makeup. Females who wear makeup on their face for six to eight hours at a time and you're allowing eight hours worth of hormones and chemicals to be absorbed into your skin. You're going to intake a portion of that. And you have to be prepared that that's going to affect your hormones. And people think, so what am I going to do? Just not wear makeup? No, there's a ton of great natural products. Unfortunately, I don't know of those natural ones. But you know, actually, you know what? I'm going to do some research. You know what? Neora actually has a phenomenal, phenomenal brand and product line. Um, again, we're not affiliated with them, but uh, I, I do know someone who uses a ton of Neora products. And I've seen their... Uh, their stuff and it's been pretty phenomenal so um i'll drop a link for you guys to to check them out there but um essentially there are a ton of products that are really really great for you to be able to put on your skin 
Same thing with lotions that help your skin that don't absorb and be able to pull that through. Now, ultimately, when it comes to keeping these three hormones in line, the estrogen, the cortisol, and the thyroid, people will say, well, okay, so I understand what the issues are. What exactly can I do about this? Well, the majority of estrogen issues, they result in stomach issues. So what you need to do is you need to start managing your gut health, start limiting the plastics and start eating foods that are better to help break down estrogen. So what are those foods? Foods with zinc, foods with magnesium and foods with iron. So zinc, magnesium, and iron. So any type of seed or nut, cashews, almonds, nut butters, any high level fat, avocado, fish. Um, I should have probably had a list prior to this, but I thought that I could come up with more foods. Uh, Brazil nuts. So any high level fat food or any nut or seed tends to have high levels of zinc and magnesium. And the iron, iron is going to be either from lean red meats, or you're going to have to take it as a supplement. Some females need to take it from a supplement form. Um, a couple of our clients have to, but with that, at least it's going to cover those three. What those three nutrients do from an estrogen perspective is they help bind to estrogen and make sure that the estrogen cannot be used by the body. So if you think of like, your body has a parking lot and the parking lot's got like 50 spaces and each space is reserved for an estrogen cell. We want to have cars being able to park all the time. We don't want parking to be full because then that's going to start to, those estrogen cells are going to park in other parts of the body. That's going to make you gain fat in other parts of the body. We want to have enough spaces for estrogen to sit there. But if the spots are full, we want to be able to say, don't make any more estrogen. So what happens is, is zinc, magnesium, and iron act as a placeholder. So think of it like they put a cone on the spot and they're like, it's reserved for estrogen. So any additional estrogen that comes in, it goes, oh, that spot's already taken. I guess I can't park here. I've got to leave. And if they leave, then it leaves the system. So with those three nutrients, you're able to basically mitigate and change how much estrogen your body is using. Now, to change how much estrogen your body's making, you have to look at someone's hormone cycle. Through this, you have to look at what stage of life they are. And I haven't talked about this yet, but it's really, really relevant for, for the guide to women's hormones. Being pre and postnatal changes your hormone level. Also being pre or postmenopause changes your hormone level. For pre and postnatal, for prenatal, your estrogen is always trying to increase for the purpose of having kids. When you're postnatal, the body's trying to minimize the estrogen to get rid of that there. So with both of those, you need to take a look at someone's, I guess, journey in life or position in life, what exactly they're experiencing, because that's going to determine how much estrogen is in their body and where it leaves. Now, for your pre and post menopause cycle, pre menopause, the estrogen is starting to significantly increase. When you are in a menopausal state, regardless of how long that lasts for two years, for four years, for however long that lasts, it's different for every woman, your estrogen is going to be at its highest level possible meaning you're going to have to do all of these things to lower your estrogen profile. Once you go through that menopause state, your estrogen drops down to about 10 to 20% of its normal level. And it stays like that. So women who often go through menopause start to experience weight issues and metabolic issues simply because estrogen is higher. And that means that they're going to have to continue to store fat. Now, of course, you can do something about that. During the process, just as I talk about having these high peaks and these low valleys, we can change up your hormone process to be a steady, slight curve. Not too much of a change through menopause and not too much of a change 
through your ovulation cycle. With that, it allows you to be stable. So nutrition, big part. Now, exercise. Exercise is really, really important. Exercise essentially reduces estrogen by using the weight and it reduces cortisol. So for with both of those, it helps regular menstruation. It's really, really important that you exercise and you do strength training at least two to three times a week. If you're afraid to lift weights, don't worry. You're not going to become some block human being. You need to be doing strength training to build muscles because it helps reduce estrogen and it helps stabilize your cortisol level. Third thing is sleep. From a sleep perspective, sleep deprivation slows down the release of hormones and it increases your cortisol level. So you want to know the easiest way to throw your hormones off? Start shorting your sleep. Your thyroid will slow down and your cortisol is going to shoot through the roof. Sleep is where we repair and we recover. So with this, making sure that you're sleeping at least six hours a night. I I hate saying that, but I'm not going to lie to you. That is the minimal. And it has to be high quality sleep. Not tossing and turning or you're lying in bed for six hours, but you're actually passed out for four. I mean, fully sleeping a minimum of six high quality hours. That's the bare minimum you need for you to sleep. Ideally, eight. I get eight hours every single night. And sometimes I'll openly admit that's not enough for me. I'm more of a nine hour guy and I feel rested and recovered. So that is essentially the things that we need to start taking a look at. Here's the things that I want you to look out for. So ladies, pay attention. Guys, also pay attention. There are certain ranges of normal estrogen levels. If you go and you get yourself checked by a doctor or you get yourself checked by a naturopath and there is a range, but between adult, so there's different ranges between adulthood, pregnancy, and pre post menopause. So from an estrogen perspective, if you're just have regular estrogen, you're not pregnant, you're not through your menopause cycle yet, between 30 to 400 milliliters, that is essentially what the average estrogen level is. The younger you are, the higher that that is going to be. Now, 300 to 400 is a really, really big range. Everyone, depending on their metabolism, their their body type, your range is going to be lower But if you're within that range, that's what they consider from a doctor perspective, normal levels. Now, during pregnancy, it's 5,500 to 30,000 milliliters. So with that, that's uh, fluctuating through your body. So those levels are normal. Now, postmenopausal, anything above 30 milliliters is good. So do you see the complete difference between how estrogen ranges as you start to get older throughout your life and you start to see the changes. Those are the normal levels. From a cortisol perspective, there is no set range for cortisol because everyone has a different tolerance level. So that depends completely on your body. Start watching the way that your body feels. Start watching the way that your digestion is and start watching the way that your recovery is. If you can look and keep an eye on estrogen, cortisol, and thyroid, that's going to be able to basically keep your hormones as steady as possible. And if you're not sure what to look for, then of course you can reach out to us. Our hormone reboot protocol is specifically designed to help mitigate the effects of estrogen, to make sure that someone's weight is completely stable, to make sure that their thyroid is running as fast as possible. Because a fast running thyroid is a happy running thyroid. That is all for today's episode. Thanks for listening. Well, it seems I'm all out of info juice for today. That's all for this episode. And thank you so much for listening. Please leave a raving review for me if you've learned something good and make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode. Now, if you're in the mood for some more great content and tools to get your hormones on track, why not check out our free Facebook group and the blog on our site. We do amazing weekly trainings in our group that me and my wife call T and Teachings that give good tips for anything hormones and metabolism related. It's also a great community where you get to share your goals and success with like-minded people just like you. 
I'll make sure to drop both the Facebook group link and the blog link in the show notes for you. Um, or if you're ambitious like me, the name of the group is Weight Loss and Balanced Hormones. Uh, it'll say Fit for All beside it with a picture of me. So come and join us and have more fun. 